so we did all the searches will ayahuasca kill me will will ayahuasca break my brain and all of that yeah. stuff and so 2017 in january right after i got out of the legislature we found ourselves in an ayahuasca ceremony just the two of us and this wonderful guide really changed everything I'm Harmony Williams, and this is Life Changing Trips. Sometimes it's hard to see the freedom and the beauty that lives behind the weight of everything we carry. But I believe that life is so amazing, and I can't waste another moment. I'm so excited to be here with you for another transformational conversation about experiences and the latest research on plant medicine, meditation, breath work, and other unconventional modalities and how they are being used for mental health and expansion. I hope by listening that you will find ways to integrate your peak experiences and epiphanies to open up new levels of possibilities, ingenuity, and fulfillment in business and deeper, authentic connection and passion in your relationships and a feeling of purpose of living fully alive. All content is for informational, entertainment, educational, and harm reduction purposes only. Life-Changing Trips and Harmony Williams and their affiliates and guests are not doctors or mental health professionals or legal advisors. Any information shared is not meant to treat, diagnose, or claim cures for any physical conditions or mental illness. Psychedelics and sacred plant medicines are not for everyone, even when done legally. There are serious contraindications with various health conditions and pharmaceutical medications. Please do your own research and take action to be informed. Remember that you are 100% responsible for your actions and subsequent consequences. The views of the guests are not the views and opinions of life-changing trips. Hi, thanks so much for listening. I want to remind everyone to go and sign up for Yin on Fire. Get your tickets now. You can use our referral link in the description and you will save $25 if you register by July 1st. It is in Cedar City in September and it is going to be incredible. Some It's at a man-made lake with these giant water slides, there's zip lines, there's paddle boarding, there is live music, spark talks, and tons of really cool workshops. Some of the workshops will be... Ice baths, drumming, meditation, breath work, kundalini, healing sexual trauma, channeling your book. There will be food vendors, a marketplace, and tons of really great music. I'm super excited. Okay, on to our guest today, Steve Urquhart. He, this was one of my favorite, favorite interviews. He's so vulnerable, he's so open. And not only is he super knowledgeable on the law and psychedelics, because he's been in the Senate, he's a lawyer, he is just really real about the mental health and the issues that people face there. I highly recommend checking out their the Divine Assembly website and becoming a member if you are at all involved in using plant medicine for your spiritual practice, then it is ideal to become a member that is free. You can become a card-carrying member for a $75 donation, and they have lots and lots of resources and information on their website. So check out the show notes to look at their website. Okay, last thing, I am going to be doing a group Zoom call Wednesday, July 12th at 1 p.m. And even if you can't make it live, you can sign up for it to be able to get the recording. So we are going to talk about breaking down the walls that we put around our heart, opening up a little bit. I've had some requests also from people who are on a weight loss journey and just want to feel comfortable and happy in their body. And that will help with that also as we break down these walls that we've put up around our heart and free ourselves then the weight falls off so much more effortlessly and you're led you're aligned to those things that will be most beneficial for your body and your soul we will do breath work and meditation around this and you guys the people that i have done this with the results are incredible the peace the presence the alignment The calm after just one session is amazing. So for your own health, for your own mental health, 
come or get the recording and hop on with us. And it's something that we'll be posting about in our community. So if you're a member of Life Changing Trips community on Facebook, I'll have information there and you can even pre-post questions. We will do some coaching and I will be answering any questions you have if you are preparing for a plant medicine journey or you're microdosing right now and you have some questions then we'll have some time for that at the end. So hope you jump on and join us for that call. That call is free to our life-changing trips community. So if you're feeling stuck or blocked, join our life-changing trips community on July 12th. I'm so excited to have Steve Urquhart here. Thank you so much for coming. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Good to be on. So Steve Urquhart is a lawyer, a former state senator, and the co-founder of the Divine Assembly, a church with magic mushroom sacrament. So if you want to tell us a little bit more, um, just kind of introduce yourself quickly, and then we can get into maybe start with your story. Yeah, sure. I live in Salt Lake, grew up in Houston, Um, four kids. That's probably a good start. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I'd love to start with, um, man, I could go a million places with you and so many stories, but I'd just love to start with like, how in the heck did you get involved in any of this stuff? Like how, and, and specifically how, um, why is it so important to you? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, So I was in the Utah legislature 2001 to 2016. And uh, toward the end of that, um, it really was kind of a lost soul. Um, You know, I was really struggling. I had, I grew up, joined the Mormon church when I was 10 and uh, left it probably around, I mean, you know, lost interest, realized it wasn't what it purported to be around 2008, 2009. And then, uh, didn't know what to do. I mean, I've supplied my whole moral ethical compass. And, uh, so that's kind of a weird thing when you are, you know, middle age, getting older and, uh, just realize that what you lived by the values, the ideals, the stories that it was just someone else's fiction. So it was kind of lost. Well, it was pretty lost and uh, didn't know what to do. So medicated, self-medicated with uh, alcohol, um, opioids, and, uh, you know, it just kind of all went downhill from there. And, uh, you know, that really was kind of lost 2013, 14, 15, 16. And so... You know, what I say is practically every day in the legislature toward the end, I was drunk and or stoned. Um, Some people say, yeah, we look at your voting record and it looks like it. But um, wow. (laughs) No, no one's ever said that. But uh, I'm sure they've thought it. But, um, you know, I was really struggling and uh, managed to get out of the legislature without you know, totally blowing up without scandal and, uh, just kind of limped off that stage. And, uh, so I was kind of a smoldering mess and, uh, my wife, Sarah, because of me, because she also lost her faith, uh, got screwed over in a business she had set up. Um, you know, she also was really hurting. And so I had some friends who had experienced ayahuasca and, a lot of healing through that. And, uh, I talked with her. We remember exactly where we were. We were visiting our son. We were out in, uh, Cambridge and, uh, just over dinner, I just said, Hey, these friends, they're using something called ayahuasca and they're, uh, it's really doing good things for them. And, um, I thought, yeah, she's a good Mormon girl. She, she toes the line. And, uh, I thought she'd just have no interest, but she wanted to know more. And so we did all the searches. Will ayahuasca kill me? Will, will ayahuasca break my brain and all of that yeah. stuff. And so 2017, uh, in January, right after I got out of the legislature, we found ourselves in an ayahuasca ceremony, just the two of us and this wonderful guide. 
and uh, really changed everything. Oh man, do you want to share anything about that experience or specifically like it's so it's so hard to describe, but how it changed how it changed you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty fascinating. Sarah, she dots her eyes and crosses her T's. She likes her lists. I'm rather chaotic. And so she went in with a list of five things. Um, number three was Steve question mark. And, uh, you know, what, what should she do about me, about us? You know, I'd given her a lot of heartbreak and, um, so, um, I'm on the other side of the room and, uh, uh, I actually was immediately in a garden with God. And, uh, so God really loved me and I could feel that. Um, and you know, I was kind of messing around with God. We were kind of playing, just reforming the garden in the style of Monet and the style of Matisse and the style of George O'Keefe and just messing around. And so she said, what, what does it look like to you? And so I said, well, I'm not an artist. And so God smiled and said, yes, you are. What does it look like to you? So I did the, redid the garden and it was just the most spectacular thing ever. And, you know, that just really was important to me to me to realize, wow, there is this creativity that I've been stepping on. And then God was just so in love with me and uh, more in love with me than any other human who'd ever walked the earth. So I'm like, oh, wow, I've read about this. This is delusions of grandeur. And, you know, this sounds like somewhere I don't want to go. And well, I was uh, thinking unconditional love, but you went to delusions of grandeur. <laughs> well, I mean, no, it was true. God absolutely loved me more than anyone else. Anyone I could tell. Else. Oh, God okay. I thought moved. you meant more than any other human had loved you. No, no. And God loved me more you than... Mean you were more special than anyone else. More special than oh, okay. anyone else. Well, and so I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. And so um, then all of a sudden this hot wind started to blow and everything started to dry up and turn to dust and just blow away. And I was left with just this sand and the sand blew away. The earth was all cracked. And so I'm like, shit, I, I did that. Something about me, there's something toxic about me. I did this. I don't know what I did. And so Sarah on the other side of the room, she's having, you know, a, uh, just kind of checking things off her list, right? Not having these amazing visions. And so for number three, Steve, she wrote, Steve loves me as much as he can. It's not enough. And um, she told me that afterwards. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And, you know, I was kind of figured there's something incomplete about my love that, you know, I love to a certain point and then it ends. And, uh, you know, I wish that I could be closer to her, to the kids. It's like, I don't really know how, but that, uh, that was journey number one where, uh, in the funny thing is it kind of was the Rosetta stone for my life. It's, I mean, that was beginning of 2017. So here we are three years later and I'm just now kind of figuring out what that meant, what it is, what to do about it. Um, you know, I think we get that a lot in psychedelics that we'll see these things that were like, that I think was important. I don't know what the hell that meant. And so that was one of those things, but you know, it was very marvelous seeing all of the imagery and everything was great up until my toxicity destroyed it, just burned it all up. And, uh, so put those two things together, my experience, God loving me, loving me in a way that I didn't understand a way that I ultimately rejected Sarah across the room writing, Steve loves me as much as he can. It's not enough. That kind of set me up on a journey, which is my personal journey of learning what love is, how I love and how I can love and what love is all about. And so, um, you know, I imagine we can discuss details of that, but I think to tell the full journey, it would take six years because that's, you know, that's, that's what it's been just bit by bit by bit, picking up on the idea of love and what is love. 
Yeah, maybe that's a book. I I will definitely read that book when you guys write it. So I think that's super relatable. Like a lot of people feel like um, maybe like, oh man, I'm not a good enough dad or I'm not a good enough spouse or I'm not a good enough mom. I want to be, I want to love and, and be more it's hard to explain, right? Be more than what I am, but I don't know how. And for me, it did open up just like this little glimpse of how I could open up to more of my infinite self and more of just loving myself and others through all our faults and all the craziness and all the good things. It's just hard to describe, you know, till you try. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we are this, uh, accumulation of experiences and traumas. And um, a few years later, I was in a ceremony and uh, I had, it was after two nights that were kind of duds for me. And so I went to the guide and I said, Hey, I don't think I want to do night three. This isn't working out so great. And I'm just sick. I don't, I don't feel good. That's all I'm getting out of this is just pain and suffering. And he said, well, why haven't you asked me for help? And I'm like, oh, I didn't know I could. He's like, well, that's why I'm here. And so, you know, I by that point, I had felt really comfortable with mushrooms. And so I said, I'd rather just do mushrooms. And he's like, you know, the program really is ayahuasca. That's why we're here. And he said, how about you do ayahuasca and do some mushrooms on top of that. And so I did same ayahuasca as everyone else. And we were doing re-ups that night. So we were like all night long with ayahuasca. And then I took four grams of mushrooms on top of it. So it was, it was, I was ready to go. And so really started struggling. And so I told him I needed help and he helped guide me to this pretty cool place where, um, I saw myself in fifth grade when I was a crossing guard. I remember it all too well, where I would just sit on this corner by myself and just cry, watching for students to approach. And then I'd dry my tears. Hey, how are you? Good morning. You know, get them across the street. And I'd just go back to crying because I felt so incredibly isolated that, you know, no one in the world loved me or cared about me. My brother, you know, I had one of my brothers had committed suicide a few years earlier no adult really talked to me about it i didn't know what was going on um so i i talked with that little boy younger version of me right and so i said hey just want you to know um life's not always this shitty um you know get married have a wonderful wife wonderful kids and he's like oh tell me about them so i told him about them and so, you know, it was a nice bond, it was a nice connection. And then I said something, because I speak to myself, I spoke to myself at that point very poorly. And so he's younger me, so I can speak to him poorly, right? Not I, I I speak well to other people. I do not berate people. I do not, I just don't. And uh, so I said to him, I said, yeah, we're not always this pathetic, right? So in other words, I'm saying, I'm not pathetic. You are. And, uh, so he was, I mean, I knew that look, he was just hurt and pissed. And so he's like, he said, you see me like dad sees me. And, uh, so he said, uh, he said, I am here standing guard, which, you know, crossing guard. And I I think all this stuff is so metaphorical. I think it's our subconscious trying to serve up information for us, a place that doesn't have language. And so he said, I stood guard here all by myself. I have no one. And you know that you have family. That's awesome. That's great for you. I'm so excited for you, but you have that because I stood guard. I did what I had to do all by myself. And you're going to come back and call me pathetic. You know, I don't know if you've ever been bitched out by your 10 year old self, but it's, it's something. And so, um, you know, a lot of details and all this, but I ended up kind of seeing my soul that night and mm-hmm. seeing that it was strong and majestic. And that's the soul that that 10 year old had, you know, and, uh, I wasn't pathetic. I just was alone. I was just sad. I didn't know what was, 
which way was up. And so, um, you know, from that point forward, my, at least my language changed that I would use in my mind. Right. I mean, 30 times a day before that, something would go wrong. I'd go, you stupid mother. Mm. And I mean, I don't ever, I don't call anyone else a stupid mother, but myself 30 times a day. Wow. And, uh, you know, so seeing my soul, getting a new appreciation for my younger self, I wasn't pathetic. I was just sad. I was alone. Um, that, that really was a big part in the change that psychedelics helped occasion. Incredible. I, I want to, I want to talk all about all your in-depth stories and like, I'm so glad you shared that like piece of you and your soul and your child. Like it's just incredible. And I, I appreciate you being so vulnerable. I've watched lots of podcasts and listened to you on Instagram and you're just vulnerable you're out there and saying like, this is hard for me and this is what I'm working on and all of those things. And um, you tell part of the story on one of the podcasts with you and Sarah, and she tells about her realization later that yeah, like you said, she, she's like, he's not enough, right? He loves me, but it's not enough. And then her realization that like, Oh, he can change. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I, what do you think that I want to get into the legal stuff too, but if you'll stay another minute for me here on like that relationship and have you been able to change? Yeah. And then I, I guess the next follow up, if you can help me remember is, do you think you could have gotten there with just therapy or without psychedelics? Yeah. Thank you. Great questions. Um, yeah, I mean, every relationship we have is either static or it is evolving. And so our relationship continues to evolve. And um, like I said, my journey is learning to love. And so, you know, a couple other uh, journeys I had was I did realize that um, I, I don't love fully and fiercely, that there's something about that that scares me. And, uh, you know, I didn't quite know what that is. And it's like, it's especially the people I love the most, the ones I'm closest to, there's some barrier there that just shallows me out, you know, to where, I mean, I go deep with anyone I just met at coffee, but with the people I really love, I just get scared, you know, to, to have the deep conversations, the meaningful conversations, you know, I guess, cause the fear is, I'll, you know, I'll go beneath the surface and they'll just say, you're a stupid motherfucker. I don't ever want to see you again. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. So, well, it's easy. If, if this new person you met, Harmony I, Williams, you know, she doesn't about. like you, whatever. It's fine yeah. if she doesn't like you or she thinks you're dumb or whatever, or this person at coffee, but then the ones you really care about, it's scary yeah. for them yes. to see that. Yeah. So, um, you know, psychedelics, they really cracked me open to see things, um, to see that there was something about my love that was incomplete. I mean, you know, exactly like Sarah said, I can love to a certain point and it's not enough. And, you know, all my kids are adults and one of my daughters sat me down and I really loved it. She basically opened up that can just saying that, you know, she needs, <laughs> we're a lot alike, this daughter, and she just needs me to figure my shit out so she can know that there is a solution to it and that she'll know what the other side of this looks because, um, you know, she was saying that she dates a lot of men who are like me. They're just, they come on like gangbusters and then they hit this point. And it's not enough, right? That, that's all they have to get. Boom, that's it. They get to a point where they're scared, where they, they're just backpedaling. And so uh, that was awesome that she gave me that opportunity. And we've, you know, some of these conversations are difficult, right? When we open them up, but then they lead to other ones. And so thinking about that, I realized, man, I do just have this thing in my mind that I'm still completely alone. Um, 
But I know that's not true. I have Sarah, I have my kids, I have a lot of people in my life. And so I started realizing my reality isn't quite real. I've always been operating on the basis of some fictions that my childhood had some scary, frustrating things in it. And uh, I think I learned to dissociate, to check out and just go for these fictions. And that's just a messed up way to live your life. If you're not seeing reality for what it is, you don't really want to see it. You want these fictions. And so psychedelics help me see some things, but what it is for me, I felt like a car engine that was just dis disassembled parts just all over the garage floor. And uh, at some point it was no longer doing me much good, right? It had shown me what it could show me. And it almost became like I was spinning around in a hall of mirrors because I had all these pieces, all these puzzle pieces, but I couldn't put them together. I didn't know how to put them together. I, I could see that my love was weird, that, you know, people scare me when I'm really in love with them. And so it got me to the point where I'm like, okay, I have some mental health issues that I look back over my life. I've had them my whole life. Um, now I'm just in, and, and I think that my reality hasn't been very real. I think that, you know, I've been creating, you know, uh, fictions. I mean, a form of psychosis almost. Well, you know? Yeah. We all make up, tell stories about what's going on to a certain degree. And I think I was that degree 10x. And <laughs> right. so, and it was causing problems. I mean, you know, I would do this with people in my life that mean a lot to me. I would get to a point in a relationship where I would end up pushing them away just by getting weird, just by, you know, and it happened repeatedly. And in my mind, it kind of made sense what was going on, but I'm like, I'm the common element in this. And so what I would tell Sarah is I'm like, I think I'm the most shallow person on this earth that I can get. I just can't go beneath the surface. And so I was telling another friend that, and so she said, she said, I'm going to have to call you out on that. She said, do you remember this conversation, this conversation? She said, those were profound. That is not a shallow person. I think you're not seeing this clearly. And I'm like, oh, and I can go deep. It's just I shallow out with the people I absolutely love the most. Boom, boom, boom. So, you know, I screwed up another important relationship to me by... This person was giving me everything she could. We were just hanging out. We were just having a good time. And I started creating these fictions that she didn't want to hang out with me. She didn't, it just, and she's just like, I don't know what this is. I've got my own issues. I've got, I don't have time for this. This hurts me. This, you know, people would get wrapped up in my distortions. And so I'm like, I need some serious help. And so, uh, you know, called in a few favors, friends who are therapists. I said, I don't think I see reality clearly and kind of described him. So boom, 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 flash forward. And I'm, you know, now two months into uh, some pretty serious therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. And so um, turns out that I have borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. which that is the puzzle right? That's, you go back to that first experience. Oh, and what I had realized pretty shortly after that first experience with God in the garden, that was Sarah. That was Sarah in the garden who does love me more than she loves any other human who walks um, the earth. It was my mind saying, see this for what it is while she's on the other side of the room saying, will you please love me with everything you have? I burned it up with my toxicity, right? My toxicity is I can love to a certain point. What it means to be borderline is you just have this all consuming sense of aloneness and a fear of abandonment. Mm. Which this explains it all that these people who I love the most, there's just mortal dread inside me, terror that they will abandon. Me. And so mm. 
you create these weird fictions that ends up pushing that end up pushing people away. And so, you know, I've always thought psychedelics, if you can couple it with therapy, yeah. great. You need to couple it with integration. I've said for a long time, if you're just, if you're doing psychedelics and not integration, you're just taking drugs. Um, but for me, because this is a real, true, diagnosable, rather profound mental health issue, I needed professional help. I don't think psych psychedelics opened it up. Thank you, mushrooms. Thank you, psychedelics, for letting me see the pieces. If I weren't able to access professional, real help to go through the exercise I'm going through, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I would have ever got there just with psychedelics and you know talking ad nauseum with friends about all the experiences. Oh, so glad you brought that up. I 100% agree that before, after, during a really trusted guide, facilitator, therapist, life coach, who's excellent at what they do, experienced and excellent for anyone. And especially if you do have some serious mental health things, right? You definitely need somebody there. Um, not just, I was thinking of that as you told your ayahuasca story where the first two nights you're like, I'm just sick, you know, like, and I hear that. Uh, if you don't have somebody to kind of help take you through and work through some of this stuff, like you said, you're just all these parts on the floor <laughs> or you're, yeah. you're uh, not able to integrate that so well the very very as i look back on all of the very borderline thing i'm like this ain't working for me fuck it i'm out <laughs> you know well, fortunately he's like hang in there hang in there <laughs> oh thank you okay i want to move on because this is a huge huge thing and we don't have i loved i got to attend uh mushroom church uh the tda a few weeks ago and we don't really have anything like that we have a great community in saint george here of just people who are intentional and doing their best and doing good things. Yeah. And the way that you guys talk about the legality, the Religious Reformation Act, how to protect yourself and make sure you're not just doing drugs and partying, but you're actually making this your cen central to your religion and to your sincere spiritual practice. Maybe those are the terminology. You'll know them all better, but can you give us some insight into there, what people can do if they are sincere and they do want to do this and they're afraid of the law. Yeah. Um, yeah. So first off, let's go down or I want to go down to Washington County um, in July or so. And uh, yeah, maybe let's get together a bunch of us and just talk. I think there are very exciting things going down, going on in Washington County not that anyone needs me or needs TDA down there because some really cool things, but the protections are real. Uh, we can go into that if you want. It it, it has protected uh, several people when it comes to law and government. And yeah, so, so a little, I'd love to hear some stories and, and yeah. your view on that. Yeah, a little added protection is, is always good. Um, yeah, a big reason that we started the Divine Assembly is realizing no one needs us to do mushrooms. Mushrooms have been around a long time before us and uh, people are doing it just fine. But in the legislature, I took on uh, the Mormon church on LGBTQ rights. And most of that was fighting against their so-called religious liberties. And uh, I don't know, the right to hate, the right to discriminate. I don't, I never quite understood it, but something those, that- Those religious liber liberties to judge and yeah, <laughs> discriminate and- Something yeah. that, something that, you know, religious is a subjective experience and something that was important to them. Um, but, you know, dealing with those arguments, I, uh, I'm a lawyer and I did go really deep on the First Amendment, religious rights and uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so uh, during a mushroom ceremony, I'm thinking, wow, what they are using as a sword to poke other people, 
really was intended to be a shield and can be used as a shield to protect uh, worthwhile religious activities. And um, I was thinking, wow, you know, there are a lot of people out there in far more vulnerable situations than I am in. Uh, this, this could be something good. So called up the s- smartest constitutional lawyer. I know a law professor and said, Hey, here's one thing, you know, blah, 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 blah. So he said, Steve, 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 I get very excited, very ramped up. And so he said, uh, he said, tell me at the end of this overlong story that you're starting a mushroom church and I'm your general counsel. I'm like, yeah, that. Yes. And, uh, so set it up and what, the way it works, what law enforcement should be looking for, what courts look for when dealing with someone's claims of religious liberty, uh, when it comes to entheogen, psychedelic substances, is they'll want to look for two things. First off, is the use safe? And uh, by the way, I think these are great sand- standards. If you're not safe, then government probably should step in, right? Because mm-hmm. it's easy to use these things safely. Um, then the other one is we can call it centrality or sincerity. I call it sincerity. But what it means is, is the entheogenic substance, the mushrooms, is it central to your sincerely held religious beliefs? So in other words, could you worship just fine without mushrooms or are the mushrooms central to your sincerely held religious beliefs? And so that's what they're going to look for. And, uh, it's tough to gauge someone's sincerity. I mean, for example, I mean, gay rights, it's a big, big thing to me. Um, if someone doesn't want to bake a cake or do the floral arrangement for a gay wedding, then the courts wouldn't really say, uh, is this person acting sincerely, right? They just assume, right? Because that's kind of where we are these days with the religion. God's hate, we get it. You know, some some gods hate uh they're yeah, yeah. Some LGBTQ gods are children playing a chess match and decide yeah. who they who yeah. gets the blessings, who is worth living, who is worth yeah. So they won't really look at sincerity when they're dealing with other people's faiths, but when it's a minority religion, a minority faith, uh they will look and see are these people being sincere? And again, I'm fine with that because uh, I mean, I think psychedelics should be legalized. We're safe. We'd be safer if they were. But for now, um, they're Schedule One controlled substances. They are illegal. The religious exemption um, deals with safe and sincere worship. So what they're looking to see is, is this person worshiping or is this person pretending to worship to get around drug laws? And so at the Divine Assembly, I think if you were to look at us three years ago, we might not pass that test just because we don't have a track record, right? We don't really, hopefully we never have doctrine. We never have dogma. We never have clergy. All of those top-down hierarchical things. I love that. And But that's kind of what courts look for, right? Do you have trained ministry and all of this? And so three years ago, we're like, do you have ministry? Nope. Do you have doctrine? Nope. Do you have, but now we have a track record where it's, it'd be tough to look at us and say, you're all just pretending. Mm-hmm. Um, because you came to our church a couple of weeks ago. Most of our events are sober, right? We're not, we don't get together and, and use mushrooms. We get together and we talk about wellness. We talk about spirituality. We talk about, what I'm talking about, my relationship with my wife. I mean, all of these pretty sober, somber, real life things. And how can we be better people? How can we connect with the universe? And this is core religious stuff. But then along with looking at the organization, they'd look at the individual that, you know, they, they cited or arrested, whatever. Is this person being safe and sincere And what we encourage members to do is to write their personal creed. They can't find TDA scriptures. So can they find Harmony Williams scriptures? Can they find Steve Urquhart's? And that is in the form of a creed. And so we encourage members to write down, what is it that you believe? Um, 
what is it that you worship? Do you believe in a divine? What is your divine? Um, what are the things you aspire to do? What are the things you try not to do? What kind of being do you want to be? And these are really profound and moving documents that they're living documents. People are continually upgrading them, amending them, but they've been very successful in courts and in front of government agencies where someone reads that and they're like, I'm not about to show this document to a jury we would lose. This clearly is religion. And then they, they go away. Mm, awesome. Yeah. I, thank you. Do you have any specific stories about people actually having run-ins with the law or going to court or anything like that? Yeah. I'll tell you three, cause they're in three different contexts that, uh, uh, kind of run the gamut. So in one, um, a licensed therapist uh, took on a client that had a lot of issues, a lot of failed attempts at therapy, and I mean, some really serious situations. Nothing else was working. And the therapist said, I will help you. I will take you on a mushroom journey and we'll integrate that. Uh, and this wasn't in Oregon. It wasn't in Colorado. It wasn't in a weed friendly, in a mushroom friendly state. So you folks who have licenses, be careful, protect those licenses. You worked very hard to get them. Um, and so the licensing board, this, this person complained to the licensing board after the fact and uh, the client and licensing board hauled in a therapist and therapist said, you know, this was a religious ceremony. This is my religion. And the licensing board looked up TDA, the website. Do you have a card? Well, yes, I do. And so we have membership cards. It's a donation thing. Um, 75 bucks. And um, mainly it's considered kind of like an NRA card or an ACLU card. It, those cards show that it, this organization has meaning to you. What they do has meaning. You donated some money. And I've seen some people go, oh, that card wouldn't work. I'm like, no, it does work. But it's not a get out of jail free card. It's not an invisibility cloak. You can't, you know, like Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy uh, uh, in the office. If you remember that. I just went out in the parking lot. I declare bankruptcy. <laughs> so Jim said it doesn't quite work that way. So you can't take a card and say, dear cop, cough, I win. And no, it's just one little sign that this is something that matters to me. Mm -hmm. And so the therapist was able to produce card. Um, so uh, licensing board said, okay, what about a creed? Do you have a creed? Well, yes, I do. Um, you know, here's my creed. Licensing board said, okay, um, we don't really approve of this, but this looks like a religion. And we don't know what to do. You know, we'll, we'll, we're done. We'll close this oh investigation. Wow. They didn't like it, but you know, there they were because religious protections in the United States really are robust. Mm -hmm. No matter what anyone says, they really are robust. And so for an entheogenic church, you just have to be serious about it. You have to be safe and sincere about it. And uh, then those protections apply. Another one, uh, some guy's business partner um, was suing saying, look, this guy needs to be kicked out of the business. Um, he's doing drugs. He's using drugs. He's managing the business while under the influence of drugs. He's doing drugs, drugs, drugs. And, uh, you know, not all drugs are alike. We know that. And, but so that went forward to court and uh, the person wanted to do a lot of discovery on this person's drug use and exactly how much, when, what, where, why. And uh, the person filed something with the court saying, this is my religion. Um, I'm safe about it. I'm sincere. Uh, this would be religious discrimination to allow discovery into this. Uh, so the judge agreed. So, you know, the standard on discovery is relevance. Could it be relevant? And that means just about anything, everything can be the subject of discovery requests. 
And for the judge to say, no, we're going to disallow that. That was significant. Wow. And yeah. Because of that, you know, the other side couldn't make a case and the guy won, won his case. Um, so that was a court setting. And then um, the third example I'll use is uh, DCFS came uh, knocking on someone's door saying, hey, you have minor children and a neighbor says that you are growing uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Um, we're going to have to investigate that. And so she said, pretty easy investigation. Uh, I'll just tell you, yes, I, I grow them. I grow a lot of them. Um, I help teach people to grow uh, as part of my religion. I'm a member of the Divine Assembly. I'll send you a link to the website. Here's my membership card. Here's my creed. Um, you know, sure, you don't intend to be, but you're involved in religious discrimination right now, religious persecution. So you need to close this investigation. And so the very next day, the investigator called her and said, we're closing the investigation. This is an issue of religious freedom. Wow. Yeah, I got, she's agreed to come on the podcast too. So we'll get a little okay. more in depth of okay, what you know she who that believed, is. like what she told them exactly and awesome. what she believed kind of helped her out in this case. And um, th so that's neat. I, I Yeah, let me, since we're, since we're talking about her, let me say another thing that did, remember safety, sincerity, she showed the sincerity. Uh they asked, can we look at your growth? She said, no, this is a sacred space. You cannot, um, by the way, I keep this door locked. And that was very important to them that diversion is always going to be significant to law enforcement. If you use religiously, you're safe, you're sincere, but you know, you're just giving it out to people for non-religious purposes. That too would be a problem that would show a lack of safety or sincerity. So that was important in her case that it was behind the locked door. And would you quickly go over, I think there was one where an ex spouse wanted to get the children from their spouse over. I, it's been a while, but um, you told me a little bit about it. If you can remember that case, maybe you don't and that's okay. Or you don't have liberty to say anything gen even generally about it. Yeah. I mean, that's part of what I'm doing. I, you know, I know several of these cases I'm going back to think who was that and how much was I authorized to say? So sorry. Uh, I, I mean, in a case like that, um, where maybe someone's taking you to your ex spouse was taking you to court, you would just need to be, I think you said there was drug testing involved and there was, you know, they really looked into oh. it, but in the end it turned out they, they won with the religious freedom, I believe. Yeah. 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 I, I think I know the one you're talking about. Um, yeah. A few subtle variations on that. What, what I would say though the overarching message on that i'm going to switch gears and i'm going to say if you have children and a custody situation with an ex who you know could bring it before a judge just be very careful because the one i'm the one that i think you're thinking about yes it finally went away, but it wasn't as simple as showing a card in membership that unfortunately involved drug testing. It involved, uh, stuff it never should have, mm -hmm. um, because there with children, the issue is best interest of the child. Yeah. And, um, the person you're going to have on who we discussed earlier, there wasn't another spouse pursuing that aggressively with the court mm -hmm. that the case you're talking that I think you're talking about was down in Provo fourth district. And there we had a guardian ad litem who just thought drugs were bad. Drugs were evil. Uh, you know, religion, nothing else really mattered. Uh, just drugs are bad. You can't have drugs around kids. And even though the very same constitutional principles that apply in a criminal setting, should apply in a family law setting, a custody setting, that best interest of the child, there can often be a lot of whims of the judges, the guardian ad litem. So yeah, I don't want to beat that one too much other than if you're in a custody situation, don't think you have a King's X and people go away. I just don't want to see anyone walk into trouble thinking they have anything even remotely 
close to an invisibility cloak in that situation. So for those of you listening who have uh, a custody situation in an, a litigious ex, uh, even though they really, really should care, courts just might not care at all that you uh, are claiming your use as religious. Thank That's you. wrong. Yes. But it's real. Yeah. But it's, it's reality. And that's, um, I think it's good, good to know, be aware, be informed and be able to protect yourself. And is it worth it? Is it worth possibly losing your kids or spending months in court? You know, yeah. it's that's something each person has to decide. Yeah. So, and, I, and I'm going to throw out another warning while we're at it. It's like yeah. part of the reason that Sarah and I wanted to start TDA is we're in Salt Lake city. Uh, our kids are grown. Um, neither of us has a job. We need to worry about drug testing or anything. So we think that we can stick our heads up a little higher than others and provide some safety through the divine assembly. But the goal really, uh, should be since we're dealing with a schedule one controlled substance, don't stick your head up higher than other folks. Don't draw a lot of attention because you don't want them coming after you. And so no matter how safe, legally safe you believe you are, always use caution. You don't need to, you know, really go out there and advocate more than you think is wise. Now, you know, here, my, my neck's out there a long ways and you're doing this podcast. And so we all need, we evaluate our situation and let's calculate the risk, but understand it is, a, it still is a legal risk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay couple things that led me to, but I wanted to first just say like, thank you so much for the work you're doing with the LGBTQ plus. I think as I was in the church, I was very blind to the fact because I loved everyone that the dogmas and the teachings, whether they came up or whether from the top of the church or they were culture were very causing a lot of harm. And there was, suicides being committed because if they couldn't change God, you know, God didn't love them or they were unworthy to be here. Then, you know, there's, there was a lot of that going on and I didn't see it. I didn't yeah. know. And um, I have friends now, you know, that have been in that situation with their children and didn't realize the harm that religion was causing their child and the mental health problems and suicide and depression problems it was causing their child to be in that religion. So thank you. And that's actually how the universe kind of brought me together. I'm not sure I would have dared to call you. I wanted to, I looked you up because I just kind of had heard about it. And <clears throat> a few days before, and I'd gone to the LGBTQ gala uh-huh. and I was like, Oh man, I, I would love to talk to this Steve guy, you know, like, That'd be so great. And it was before I started this and was just like, can I do this? It's freedom of speech, but is it going to put a like big arrow, big X on, red X on me? And, yeah. and, uh, you called and just left a personal message. Thank you. Thanking me for coming to the LGBTQ gala. And I was like, okay, I think that's a sign from the universe. I got to call uh, this guy. <laughs> that's funny. And, you were just so kind and called and chatted with me for, I don't even know, 45 minutes or something. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this. I know I'm supposed to do this. And I think, I think I can do this. So anyway, I appreciate all the help you've given me. Um, I, I, yeah, I had forgotten that. So I was on the <laughs> Equality Utah board for six years. I just rolled off, which makes me very sad. But uh, yeah, we were, we were calling people who had attended and donated. So thank you. And uh, yeah, that's always fun when you, those calls, when you bump into someone who's like, Hey, I've been wanting to talk or, you know, you meet up with an old friend. So yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was definitely, it felt not a coincidence, but I, I wanted to get your opinion on addiction with mushrooms in particular, if that's something. And I know I love the perspective you shared. I think there's a lot of people that can fall into that um, a little bit or like a chasing the next trip is the answer rather than doing the yeah. hard work to work through their stuff and progress. But what do you feel on that? If someone's worried about addiction? Yeah. I mean, addiction is a tough word. It's, it's a, it carries a lot of baggage. 
So when you look at the work out of Johns Hopkins, when you look at what the FDA uh, will be looking at when it's time to reschedule mushrooms, um, that is what they... So schedule one means that uh, there's a high potential for addiction and abuse, and there is no beneficial medical therapeutic use. And uh, now that they're finding that there clearly are beneficial medical uses for psilocybin mushrooms, it will have to be rescheduled. So then they look at the abuse potential, abuse and addiction potential. And so um, what the scientific literature shows there is that the abuse uh, and addiction potentials are extremely, extremely, extremely low for psilocybin mushrooms, in part because it's a lot of work, right? I mean, these journeys aren't, you know, uh, having they aren't all sunshine and, and rainbows and yeah. designing gardens with God. <laughs> yeah, no. And so, um, you know, having had some experience with opioids, you know, the first time you take opioids, first few times, it's just like, just wow, cool. I'm just checked out and I'm calm, you know. And, so you can see why you want to get that second one. And so first time Sarah and I did ayahuasca, we're like, that was cool. Never again. And then <laughs> like a year later we did it. We're like, okay, glad we redid it. Never again. It's just <laughs> so much work. And so part of that is they look at, you know, lab rats, they look at, and so lab rats, you know, they'll take cocaine and well, they'll just keep eating until they die if they get the chance. Cause just chasing that high and, uh, psychedelics mushrooms they're like they do it once they're like i'm staying away from that that was <laughs> that was too much um but humans also there's just very little indication that it is addictive um so more the abuse potential it's like you know there are very few people who run out and they want just a hero's dose of mushrooms every day every week whatever because it is so much work but I think, you know, maybe the way I'm going to answer that is kind of bypass, you know, spiritual, emotional, therapeutic bypass that uh, I think that's kind of what I was referring to earlier in my story. And that's why I told it is I wasn't trying to bypass the work, but I needed to do work with a real licensed therapist who could therapist who could work on the four skills of mindfulness, emotional uh regulation tolerating distress and effective interpersonal reactions those are the four things that you know i am working on um that was the next step for me if i had just kept using psychedelics and never doing that i probably would have got more insights into different things and it would have helped in some ways but it would it just might have become more and more frustrating that here I'm improving in all these ways, but I still keep banging my head against this wall. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to talk about others when we talk about ab abusing psychedelics or bypass. I'm going to talk about myself and just say that uh, most of the work we have to do is outside of the ceremony. Most of the work we really have to do to benefit from psychedelics is when we're not under the influence of directly immediately acutely under the influence of psychedelics and so i think there is tons of that that goes on um you know where it's just one trip to the next and we're not really integrating and part of that is you know our western culture we don't have the traditions right you look at indigenous cultures um cultures that grew up with psychedelics well, it's part of the culture, right? They have the vessel to hold each other. And we don't really have that. And so that's part of, in TDA, what we're trying to build. We're coming out with courses for therapists, for guides, and for something we're called navigators, trained to hold space. We have a neat community, um, but I think we can be a lot more effective we can we can be better in terms of holding each other and that involves mastering some skills and uh i think well this is something i'm i'm all i'm doing right now is parroting uh 
Professor Roland Griffiths from John Hopkins and uh, Bob Jesse, uh, who you might remember from uh, How to Change Your Mind. Um, Bob ran Council for Spiritual Practices. And this is something they've been talking about for a long time before I ever got into psychedelics, is the need for these vessels where we can hold each other and really support each other. And because we don't have them, I think I do see people who are kind of getting lost in the medicine and spinning around in this hall of mirrors. Yeah. Kind of floundering a little bit. Um, as far and as I hope, and I hope that doesn't sound judgy because I think that's kind of the point where I was, where I was and yeah. that I found a way out through, through therapy. Yeah. That's have been, um, the story I've heard from some people like, Oh, this is great. And this is amazing. And then they were kind of chasing it and then like, okay, well wait, you know, and, and realizing or getting kicked out by some really bad journeys <laughs> the, by the plant saying, uh, yeah, no, you're not doing this right. Like <laughs> we're going to make it so miserable for you that you don't want to come back. <laughs> can I, can I jump in with just, can I do my own segue? Yes. <laughs> because yeah. What, so I was sitting down with a friend in January and so I was saying, you know, I think that this is when I was looking at the puzzle pieces. And I said, I don't think that I see reality clearly. And so she said, well, what is reality? And I'm like, ah, stop. I'm like, I think you're speaking from a point of mental health privilege. And uh, what I'm saying is the grass is green, the sky is blue. And I think I miss that in a lot of ways. So in a conversation, yes, there's a range of subjective interpretation. But I think I'm way over here on some of these things. And uh, I, I think that's a mental health issue. I think I'm seeing something. And so, you know, bit by bit, I'm kind of seeing this. And psychedelics absolutely are helping me see it. But where I'm to, kind of the holy grail for me is... Uh, what is the mystic? What do you see in the mystic, right? This non-normal state of consciousness, which I call the holy of holies, the sanctum sanctorum. Early on, I thought it was all of these beautiful patterns and shapes and colors. I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen it before. What does it mean? All of this. And now as I get further into it, I'm like, no, that's just kind of a different version of my life is I see all these distortions. I see all these, I can't interpret what is around me. I misinterpret. So for me, and again, this is just for me, what is in the sanctum sanctorum? What is the mystic? It's reality. That's all it is for me. It is, it is seeing what is real, what is true. Wow. Yeah, I am a huge fan. Changed my life. The Byron Katie um, the work have you have you read her book Loving What Is? And she talks about Loving What Is. That's the the name of the book. Okay, Loving What Is, out. and what is. she helps you see that. And I've used it. Oh my goodness! I read it every single day and did the work day every single day to heal a relationship with one of my sons. And the more I'm doing what she calls the work, the the better you know, a person I'm being, I think. And the more I forget about yeah. it, I get lost a little, but that's, that's what she says. God is God is love. God is reality. Yeah. So if it's raining and you don't want it to be raining, you're fighting reality. You're fighting God. Yeah. If someone's doing something you don't like, and you don't want them to be, you're just, you're fighting that reality. And we do it all the time. We have these stories about everything and it just, she just has you question reality yeah. and what you're saying. This person should do this or they should love me more. Or they shouldn't do this. And is it true? Is it really true? How do we know that's their path? That's the highest version for them to not to smoke if you think they shouldn't be smoking or whatever. Right. And then you go through and you look at how you act when you think that thought and what you're doing. And then you try and pretend like you, what, what you would be if you couldn't think that thought my husband should love me more. He shouldn't smoke, he, whatever. Right. And yeah. then if you couldn't, you would just see this human being 
and you'd love them and you'd see their beauty and their essence. That's usually what it came down to for me. And I would be clear. I wouldn't be like upset at my son. Well, you have to do this. And if you don't do your chores and if you don't get off video games and all this other crap, right? I would just see this human in front of me and I would talk to him like a human and see the love and the beauty there in his blue eyes and see him as a little tiny boy with his yellow dandelion giving it to his mom and you know just the hopes and dreams anyway i can get yeah. off on that but um and then the last one you turn it around and you look at where this that and the other so i should be doing my chores i should be being nice to if it's yeah. him being nice to his brother or whatever i yeah. should get off my video games i should stop smoking how am i smoking well i'm not phys- you know and you go into that and then <clears throat> I should be doing his chores or, you know, you have all these turnarounds and you're just looking for truth. Like what's just as true or truer and just like something to kind of switch. Oh, I thought this was reality and nothing could change it, but maybe it's not. Maybe I can just have that little switch in um, and reality is truth. This is what's happening. Yeah. I mean, the faith you and I grew up with, it's like the answers are external and they're out there. Mm-hmm. Right, the celestial kingdom, something we, there's no way on this earth we can even comprehend what it is. So just keep soldiering along and, and whatever's going on inside of us is just wrong, is evil, is dark. And uh, for me, it's just psychedelics where you think of it as pink elephants and, you know, all this stuff. It's just the total flip where the divine is inside, inside each of us. And for me, what is heaven? What is the holy and sacred? It's just being massively present in the moment, right? You and I right now, what is this conversation really about? What are you saying? Can I connect to that? Can I add a little something? And, you know, can I, can I just dial into the reality of what you and I are doing in this moment rather than some fiction, something external And it's just really bringing so much peace and beauty to my life. Ah, It's so true. And that's probably one of the biggest things in my story where I was 40 years old. I was actually, when I was researching this, still in a religion, researching it for my daughter's depression. And I was burnt out. I had been parenting for 20 years, had five kids, and I still had a kid in like diapers. And I was just done. I wanted to do something for myself. And I had this whole story going about how I couldn't start my business or I couldn't do these things because of the kids. And I was just tired and sick of it and depressed and exhausted. And it opened up that possibility that I could be in that exact same situation and have so much joy and love. And through even... I mean, man, there's been some some big, big things come through that could crush someone or I could focus on, but I could still find love and be in that moment. But after I had this afterglow after my first one for like a year. So I told this in at the, um, the beautiful group, um, with our talking stick and we each got three minutes at the divine assembly. What's the integration group. And I was telling about it and I just can't help but get excited. So I ended up standing up on my chair, like at group. And I was like, afterwards, I went to this women's group I was helping a therapist with. And I was like, you guys, life is fucking amazing and we're wasting it. And all these like 90% Mormon women were like, okay, what's going on here? But I was just yeah. so passionate and like hugging people on the street and just like you, there's so much here. And I would just be with my little one and he'd bring me a snail. And usually you're like, yeah, that's sweet. Oh, I like it. Oh yeah. Okay. Go run along, run along. I got stuff to do, you know? And I was like, ah, a snail. That's incredible. And we would look at it and I was like, whatever, like as excited as my little, I don't remember how old he was three or four year old. Right. I was just like, yeah. And we went to the river and, um, he had put mud all over himself and was just like playing in the water. And I'm like, yeah, before I would kind of watch and be like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. I'll put my feet in, you know. But after I was just like, yeah, let's paint it all over mud and it, like laying it and rolling it and dance and play and just everything. I mean, just a whole awakening, sexual awakening. Yeah. And um, that beauty that seeing each other's souls and the vulnerability that 
actually leaving the church started to open that up in my husband because he had to talk to me about it. Right. And we went deep and started like allowing each other our own journeys as I stayed in and he left. And that was super huge. I just talked about that on another podcast this morning, but that opening up and our bedroom got so fantastically amazing and exciting and incredible when we were connected, our souls were connected and open and it was just exciting. Who are you? Who am I? Let we're figuring it out. We're creating this whole new, what do we want to be? And so I told him at group about my bike ride after, and it was a year. Like I was literally, I probably would have been like put into an insane asylum at one, you know, one point in history for how I acted for a year after. And I was riding a bike, which we go mountain biking three to five times a week. Right. But I was like, it, it was like, I'd l- like come back from a near death experience is really how I describe it. And I was like, I'm riding a bicycle. <laughs> like this is incredible. Right. And I was right. energy. It wasn't my hormones. I was just passionate about life and business and kids. And, and so I was running around the circle at group and everyone was like, okay, she's literally crazy, but um, you know, it's okay. <laughs> and then the teens, the connection with the teens, I just wanted to see them and see their hearts and who they were and just connect with them and just be with them and spending time with that teen sitting at the, I still remember one of them just sitting at the duck pond, watching the swan and just talking yeah, yeah. for hours. And that being right where I was instead of, Oh, I'm cleaning over here and I'm doing work over here. And I'm always in the other place, wrong place, but it was just like being with people and experiencing the whole of yeah. life, everything. I love that. (laughs) I love that. I relate to that so much. Um, You know, it's, it's, for me, it's been fun to come into psychedelics. Uh, You know, I'm, I'm going to turn 58 uh, next week. That's old. There's no way getting around that. (laughs) Um, But that it's just opening up life so much. I mean, like you talk about a snail, things like that. I mean, now to just lay on my back and look at the clouds, it's just like, so amazing. And yeah, snails are just the most amazing thing ever. How can you not look at one of those and just be in awe playing in the river, riding a bike? I mean, uh, there's just so much of life to be enjoyed. And uh, yeah, it's fun shedding dogma as you and I have done. And then just opening up our minds and hearts to, to new experiences. Yeah. Oh man. Nature. Nature has been huge. Meditation. Um, in my journey, breath work, those different things. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of switch, switch subjects a little bit, but about cannabis and medical cannabis. It's, it's a subject I love in the Senate. Um, I ran a CBD bill, um, which was the first one in the nation to allow CBD to treat certain conditions, which maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Uh, You know, my perspective is it was a start for the state of Utah. Others can view it, maybe rightly so, that that just released some pressure and didn't do much for very many people. Um, But since then, I've been a big fan of uh, cannabis and what it can do for humans. Um, It's fun to see it becoming destigmatized in the United States. We're in such a weird place policy wise, where it's still federally illegal, but uh, decriminalized in most states. And it's so much baggage on that. But I think that cannabis uh, is awesome for adults. Um, You know, and I'm still maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe this is just, you know, dogma and all that. But I'm not a huge believer in the developing brain and substances, you know, that's all I'll say on that. But for adults, it seems like with even Michael Pollan talking about just like the younger kids, I don't know, this could just be my opinion too. Don't need it quite so much as people who are oh, yeah. older and we just get stuck in these ways and we have, uh, we need that mind shift. We're not like the young kid who's like, I'm going to go change the world and let's make it a better place kind of thing. We're just stuck. And, and we also have enough life experience that hopefully 
we're doing it intentionally and it using it for good rather than just out partying with friends. So yeah. I interrupted you, but no, I mean, but you know, even, even there, I mean, uh, you know, psychedelics in particular, maybe I, who knows, maybe every teenager should take them and it would change. I don't know, but I'm not, you know, just speaking as, as a dad, probably, you know, still a fairly conservative, uh, socially conservative father. Uh, yeah. Kids and substances. I'm not a big believer in that, but for adults, I think cannabis um, can be just awesome in all things, you know, let's use prudence and make sure are we taking care of business? Are we doing the things in our lives we need to do? But uh, we live in a world that we were not evolutionarily prepared to live in. Right. I mean, we were evolution moves slowly and we are set up for world as it existed like 700 years ago. Now it's just moving so fast. There's nothing in our genetic code that really prepares us for this, right? What you and I are doing right now for everything on our phones, for the world around us. And uh, I think plant medicine, there's a lot of, a lot of wisdom in these plants. I mean, now I'm sounding all woo, but uh, they can help us regulate. They can help us find our way. And uh, this is a crazy chaotic world. And if cannabis can, take the edge off and help us center and be mindful, then Godspeed. I like it. Thank you for your two cents on that. I know you have, we can refer people. Oh, you talk about it a little bit on Utah. We, what is it? Weeds in the, in the, in the weeds. They stopped that podcast. It was such a great one. Oh yeah. You're on that. You talk about um, cannabis a bit there and there's lots of, lots of places. Yeah, my favorite organization is Truce uh, Together for Responsible Use of Cannabis. Something she'll she'll skin me if she hears that I messed up her name. But Christine Stinkwis, she runs Truce, and they've been there from the very start and battling for medical cannabis in in Utah. She's a she's a she's a hero of mine. And I think I I really love talking with you because, as I said, I'm I'm a little naive. And I got super excited right after it like changed my life and this life changing experience. And I want to bring in people who have more experience or have seen both sides of it. I'm sure you've seen how drugs can ruin people's lives and, you know, the harmful, it's not just, um, you're, I, I don't know. It's not just some person that's super excited and super naive about it. You see both sides of it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm, I'm still very new to, to all of it, to psychedelics. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, but uh, yeah, I see that they're, these are strong substances and they can have very strong effects. Um, for positive and probably for negative. And so, yeah, let's all be, take care of each other, hold each other um, as, as we venture into this space. Awesome. Okay. I wanted to talk about the revival, the Dell. Do you uh, want to give us some info on those? Yeah. So revival's coming up next week and this is kind of the marquee event for the divine assembly. Um, uh, so my, my good friend, uh, Andrea, Andy De Silva, uh, she now runs it. It's her baby. Um, she's so good at it and it's four days, three nights, you know, or people can come up for a day, just make it whatever you want. It's in Eden. So backside of Ben Loman up by Ogden. Uh, it's a festival, but it's kind of a non-festival festival. We do have music, uh, but mostly we have like, I think 80 workshops and presentations, uh, wellness kinds of topics. Uh, we turn out the, turn off the sound at 10 PM so people can sleep kind of a nerd fest. But then we do have a silent disco from 10 PM to 2 AM for night owls like me. Um, it's a lot of fun. It really is a place where, meaningful soulful connections happen and so the website for that is our revival.org o-u-r our revival.org um yeah come come check it out even if it's just for a day and this is a yearly event it if is they miss it we'll see if we can get this 
podcast turned around. I had another one scheduled for Friday, but if I could get it turned around and we'll get you some last minute people, but if not next year. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, we did it up for the summer solstice, you know, this will be our third year, but um, we might move off the solstice next year. I don't know. Did I say winter summer solstice? Um, yeah. So we'll see when we're doing next year. And so the Dell, we have 683 acres, uh, 50 miles west of Salt Lake. It's dark sky tucked into the West Lake mountains. Uh, really a beautiful piece of property that bit by bit, year by year, we're just going to transform into a beautiful oasis and a place of uh, deep healing and worship and human connection. That's incredible. There's so, so many people that are looking for that and wanting to work together to do, do better, do more help heal all that stuff. So yeah, super excited. It's less than an hour away from Salt Lake. So that that's and you're headed out into the darkness. And so that's far enough where you feel like you've been on a journey, but really you're only an hour away. Um, so it'll be really accessible. And uh, I want to get to the point where uh, every Friday night we have Friday Fest, I'm calling it. And uh, you go out there and eat things that a dinner that we raised and grew on the property. Um, then let's have music that goes through the night in a beautiful amphitheater and uh, wake up and have a breakfast of things that we raised and grew. And uh, we have some structures that we're talking with different groups that they're going to put up some veterans, firefighters, um, survivors of conversion therapy that they will use. Other people can use when they're not there. And then bit by bit, let's uh, keep adding structures and places to worship and hang out and enjoy life and enjoy each other. We're Incredible. pretty excited in case you can't tell. Yeah. I, I love that. Oh my goodness. I don't think I could move back to the Utah winners, but I definitely want to come and visit uh, all your stuff a lot. That sounds awesome. Um, is there anything as we wrap up here, just um, that you want to leave us with or maybe tell people if they're feeling hopeless or stuck or frustrated or just your, your words of wisdom to leave us with? Um, first, I'd, I'd say uh, thank you for what you're doing. This is fun um, seeing the journey you're on and the courage that you're putting forward on this. And I hope that you're uh, feeling some good benefits from this and some contentment and enjoyment. Uh, that's part of what I'll say about everything I'm doing that I'm glad that other people are benefiting, but it might just be a really selfish exercise because I'm having a blast and I'm loving the people that I am connecting with. Uh, yeah. I just tell everyone uh, that, that life can be really, really beautiful. And I'm going to go back to what you're talking about looking at a snail, you know, it's just the simple moments like that, that there's so much joy and happiness to be found in the little vignettes and, at times we get distracted from that by what's going on in the news, what's going on in the world, and mostly by things that they just don't affect us. We can't affect them. And we lose track of the little things in life that are really the most important things that are real. they are things right in front of us, the things that we can change and we can affect. And those are the things where we will find our biggest joy and pleasure and happiness and love. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. And we'll have all the links in the show notes, but if you want to throw out the website or the easiest place to connect. Yeah. So revival again is our revival.org and the divine assembly is uh, the divine assembly.org. Put the, the in there. Highly recommend checking it out, becoming a member, donating all of those things for both to support and for your own <clears throat> your own protection and go to the meetings, my goodness. And hopefully we'll be able to set up some meetings all uh, down here in Southern Utah for people too. Yeah, so. yeah. And I guess I should throw out one other thing. The divine assembly is a platform for people to build on. And so we don't have hierarchy. We don't have dogma. And so 
uh, yeah, let's get something going down in Washington County, but people can worship on it on their own. You know, no one needs my permission or authorization to say, yeah, I dig this. This is my religion. This is where I'm going to practice in the way I want to practice or use it as a model, start your own church or religion if that can bring you some added security. But yeah, it's not like we pretend to be the one true anything or that we're necessary. We're not necessary at all. We're just a tool that hopefully people can use. Awesome. I love that. That so resonates with me. Well, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. This is a blast. Thanks so much for subscribing and leaving a review. Come join our amazing free community, Life Changing Trips. There's a link in the description.